Let's go. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Robert Moerland. I um, am here today to talk about hacking interference phenomena into your renders. Let me start off with two possible disappointments. Uh, first of all, we are in the developer attic and it says hacking in the title, but I actually didn't change a single line of code in Blender. So everything that I show you will run on a vanilla Blender 3.3. Um, the other disappointment might be that um, I am not a computer um, um, graphics scientist. I don't write renders. I don't do um, shader programming. Um, so why should you believe anything that I have to say here? <laughs> um, my name tag says illustrator, photographer. Um, so hopefully to instill a bit of faith in me, uh, the knowledge that I have 17 years of uh, academic experience in nanophotonics might alleviate the problem a bit. I see this as a double-edged sword where on the one hand what I show you is what I can uh, do and uh, to make things as physically correct as I possibly can. On the other hand, a smart computer graphics scientist might be able to do the same thing with minimal loss of visual quality and 10 times faster. But here we go, it's something and it's better than nothing, I guess. So what are we talking about? Um, you probably have all seen phenomena, phenomena like this, where you spill a bit of fuel on a wet patch on the tarmac and you get all these colors. And where do they come from? Because you did not put any paint uh, on the tarmac. Um, this is a well-known example, but if you look a bit more closely, you actually will see also on the steam pipe of a coffee machine to make milk froth, there is this rainbow-like banding effect going on as well. Um, here, this is the electronic eye of a urinoir that was just cleaned. Um, and the detergent has left a residue here that also in, uh, instills these colorful patterns. And if you got here by train, um, you might actually uh, have had a look at the windscreen here. If you zoom in, there is also this purple-yellow coloring going on. Um, but, of course, one of the major um, and most well-known examples, uh, the prettiest perhaps, is the soap bubble. And um, one of these two is a photo, and the other one is a render. And who here can immediately spot which one is a render. Who is sure like that's the render? <laughs> this result is something you can get yourself. Like the, uh, at the end of the talk, I will show you QR code and you can download uh, the notes that I'm presenting here with all the materials in it just from Blender artists and it's free to use for whatever you like. Um, so, why is this happening? So let's have a bit closer look at light. Um, we're Blender users, we know the essentials, we know reflection, we know refraction. Reflection is you have a light ray and it bumps off a surface and I can see it on my sensor camera or in this, uh, this case the computer. And refraction is this bending of light around that is caused by transparent objects. Um, at the surface here, um, this is going on with the light ray as it is treated by cycles. So we have an incoming light ray, uh, and I chose just for simplicity air and glass, but it can be any combination. Uh, but let's say air and glass, we have an incoming light ray, and a small fraction of it is reflected, and another fraction of it is refracted. And the angle with which the refraction takes place is determined by uh, a, a constant that we call in optics refractive index, though you would see it as index of refraction in Blender typically. And for air, it's about one, and for glass, it's about 1.5. Now, the, the uh, angle is determined by the refractive index, but also the amount of light that is reflected and refracted. And the first person to actually derive the equations for how much is it was Augustin Fresnel, um, to which we will get in a second. But this is the model that is implemented in cycles for glass. If you take the 
plain glass shader. What it does internally is it calculates the, the, uh, like the Fresnel coefficient, how much light is refracted or refracted, and then uh, splits it up into shaders, a refractive and a glossy shader. So you can uh, substitute this glass shader here for this small node group. It does exactly the same. If you would render both images, you get the same output. And what you see is that on the top is a refractive shader, on the bottom is a glossy shader, and the Fresnel node, so there is Mr. Fresnel, the Fresnel node is dictating a mix shader how much of the light goes where. And the angle uh, dependency, you see back if you look at the Fresnel node itself, with the node wrangle, for example, for example um, the steeper the angle is, the more light will be reflected. It's uh, exactly what, uh, if you've seen the talk by uh, the, uh, Andrew Price, he said exactly the same. So this is really essential for photorealism. So, that is thick uh, objects. Let's go to a thinner object, but still relatively thick. Let's say a millimeter or so. This is microscopic for light. What happens is I have my light ray coming in, a bit is refracted, uh, reflected, large amount is refracted, then I get an internal reflection which is then subsequently again refracted. And cycles will take these two light rays that are reflected, add them together, and that's your output. But if you now go to really thin films, and that's not a millimeter but a thousandth of a millimeter or smaller, you cannot circumvent looking at light as a wave. So at this scale, you cannot distinguish anymore like light is a ray, you have to look at it as waves. But the essences are still the same. I have a wave coming in, I have a wave that is reflected, it has a bit smaller amplitude because it's less intense. I have a refracted wave, which is then internally reflected and also refract it again. But the major difference here is that the amplitude of the first reflection and the second reflection can be opposite in phase. So they are, instead of adding, they are canceling each other or at least partially canceling each other. Well, this phenomenon goes on and on and on for an infinite amount of times until I don't have any light that is coming out anymore. And that is the end result of what cycles should report to your virtual camera, like this is the color of the pixel. Um, the color of the pixel also depends on the wavelength of the light, which is just the color of your light. It depends on the angle of incidence. It depends on the refractive index of your film. And it depends on the thickness of the film. And you can even go beyond this it doesn't need to be glass, it can be a metal, it can be an absorber, and why stop at a uh, thin film in air? You can also make, make your substrate a metal, a glass, or an absorber. So summarizing, thin film interference and the color of your pixels depend on the incoming color, the wavelength, the angle, film thickness, the refractive index of your film, and the refractive index of your substrate. My goal was to create a node for thin film interference that would replace this Fresnel node and give you a physically accurate uh, model that actually shows the interference. That's versatile, easy to use, and GPU compatible. Um, implementation, which is gonna be high level because I would like to show you the examples, um, but this from code to note, um, I implemented this first in um, OSL, so Open Shading Language. And um, for, for this kind of, of uh, physical problem, it's very useful to use complex math. And if you're not familiar with complex math, it's essentially an extension of the everyday math that we have, uh, but it's really good at bookkeeping uh, waves and phases and how they add together. So it's an easy tool to do uh, or to have, but it's not available in open shading language itself, so I implemented it. 
Python, on the other hand, does have complex numbers, so I used Python to benchmark that what I did in OSL was actually working and correct within machine precision. Then, as I said, I've worked um, as a researcher in nanophotonics for quite a while. I have MATLAB code that uh, tackled this phenomenon, um, and I ported it to both Python and Open Shadow Language because I'm not in academia anymore. MATLAB licenses are expensive, and Python is there. Um, and I used both these implementations to benchmark the one against the other. Um, on the left hand, you see one of the more uh, uh, intricate examples with, uh, with uh, uh, wildly varying colors as a function of angle, which, which are physically correct. And on the right hand side, you see the difference between the Python implementation and the OSL implementation, which is um, for academic standards not great, but for visuals, it's fine. And then I had a working and benchmarked OSL code. Um, I wanted notes. I was very happy to come across uh, uh, OSL Pi by Lazy Dodo, uh, Ray Molenkamp. Um, the only drawback here was that it was last updated May 2018 and for Blender 2.8. By now, Blender 3.3 has way more uh, versatility with the vector math notes, and I found a little bug. So I benchmarked. Um, OSL Pi conversion from OSL to the node groups by uh, both visually checking that this was uh, uh, like what I wrote in OSL was actually also translated to the correct node group and by uh, simply running the OSL code versus the node and making sure that the difference would be zero. So it's, it's all benchmarked uh, to the best of my uh, abilities, but no guarantees. Results. Um, three node groups. One on the left, a thin layer on glass. In the middle, a thin layer on a conductor or a metal or an absorber. And on the right, a double layer on a conductor. And to start off with the first one here, um, layer on glass, this is how you hook it up. So this is the Fresnel uh, substitute, as it were. Um, you can just add a refractive index, I call it N, it's the, the custom way of calling an index of refraction in, in, in physics, N. Um, you can add the uh, refractive index and the extinction coefficient of your layer and the thickness and the rest will automatically follow. So here's the soap film. On the left, uh, the refractive index of the substrate is air. Um, therefore, it's one. The layer is simply 1.4 for the red, the green, and the blue value. You can see that the N layer actually is a color input, so you can add a different refractive index for each color. And then I animated the thickness D, and you automatically get the colors that you see on the right-hand side. Oil film, where I, for a dramatic effect, did not connect the transmitted note, uh, transmitted light note, um, so you really get this dark patch uh, of material with the interference coming from your oil spill. Um, and the only difference here is the refractive index that I put in there. Uh, the layer, uh, the substrate is water and is 1.33 and the thin layer has a refractive index of 1.6, which is something like turpentine, I believe. Um, Anti-reflection coating, commonly used on optics, like your, your spectacles, your, your camera objectives, etc. cetera. Um, there is a very simple version of an anti-reflection coating um, which uses a magical uh, thickness of your layer. If you make the layer zero, you get the plain glass. If you connect the node to have the correct uh, thickness, you see that the reflection actually reduces. And um, it's reduced and not gone because this uh, simple anti-reflection coating only works for a single wavelength. So the other colors are still partially there. Um, layer on a conductor, it's uh, slightly different in the sense that now you can choose your uh, uh, refractive index and extinction coefficient also for your substrate. And this allows you to use metals. So metals also have a refractive index and they have an extinction coefficient. Um, so before going to the layer part, um, 
I want to show you an example of just using this as a metal shader. Um, like I said before, the colors give you, or the N and K are color inputs. So you would need to hook up the refractive index of the metal that you would like to use um, with a color input box, just a note. And you get these values from websites like refractiveindex.info where you type in the wavelength that you want to use and it says, this is the refractive index of this material at that wavelength. So, here on the left, I did that for copper. There's a copper N and a copper K for red, green, and blue in both cases. And I just connect the node to a glossy shader and you immediately get something that looks like copper. You can do the same for gold. The values for uh, N and K are different, but you automatically get a gold colored uh, substrate. Like I said, I am not a computer uh, graphics scientist and um, uh, uh, nor am I a coder. Uh, we have Lucas Stockner in the audience who is a coder and uh, who knows uh, approximations better than me. So if you only want to have a realistic metal shader, what I created here is then overkill for you because it calculates too much. And within a good uh, approximation, you can get very lifelike results. Um, and tomorrow, Lucas will talk about the implementation in that in the principal shader in Blender. But what that can, cannot do is then adding, for example, an oxide on your copper layer. So I just took refractive index of copper oxide from refractiveindex.info and um, I drive the thickness from zero and then you get your plain freshly cut copper color. And if you add the thickness of the copper oxide with some noise pattern, you get what I think is a pretty decent aged copper look. Heating of iron, if you remember the steam frothing pipe, um, the iron uh, refractive index, you plug them in, the iron oxide refractive index, you plug them in, you drive the thickness of your layer and you automatically get the colors that you see here. And on the right hand side, you see a small uh, piece of uh, differentially tempered steel, which essentially is the same color scale. And um, finally, uh, no, not finally, one more example, silicon with an oxide layer. If anybody ever worked in a clean room, they have silicon wafers there and silicon itself looks a bit gray bluish as you see when the layer is zero, but it automatically oxidizes as well or sometimes in a processing step, you add oxide and it turns purple. But the kind of purple depends again on the angle. Um, you just cleaned your kitchen and somebody puts their greasy finger on your, uh, on your metal. Um, it is an interference effect. So this is how you get like a realistic fingerprint on your metal. Then finally, a bit garish, but uh, this was a special request in the Blender Artist thread. Um, double layer uh, for uh, mimicking polychromic car paints. And they are typically uh, made from a sandwich of a very thin top layer of metal, then a dielectric layer, a glassy layer, and then again a metal bottom layer. So in this case, I have uh, chosen chromium, um, six nanometers, so that is six billionth of a millimeter, yes. Um, and it's partially transparent. And then there's the glass, and then there's aluminum, which is optically thick, so it only reflects. And I drive the thickness of the glass layer, and you should start to see something, maybe now. Huh. Interesting. Luckily, I'm doing this on my own laptop, so I can just go there. Uh, here then. There we go. That's what you get if you drive the thickness. And it goes completely all over the place, but some people like it. <laughs> right. Back to the presentation. Oh. Did it. 
Do, 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 do. Luckily, I don't have many slides. Ah! <laughs> sure. Limitations. Because I said I just, uh, like to the best of my capabilities, I made it physically correct, but there are uh, limitations in a renderer that is based on RGB. So, um, on the left-hand side, as an example, you see the soap film color as a function of soap film thickness for what would be in a spectral renderer. And I took the D65 uh, white point here. And what you see is that initially it starts out with the color banding, but as the film comes, becomes thicker, you will get uh, a, a sort of gray reflection, which is exactly what we expect from glass. Thick glass reflects like white and not colored. Uh, cycles, uh, the cycles implementation will just keep going. It will never stop. But then again, it is thin film interference. So if you go for thin film and then smack like a millimeter on top of your model, then it's not really thin film anymore. So, but anyway, there, there is a limit to the usability here. But I think, like, let's say in this case, 700 nanometer, 0 0.7 micron, um, it's pretty much the same as a spectral renderer, at least visually. Other limitation is uh, if you have roughness, the um, micro facet model and this node group, they don't communicate. So the node group calculates the ink, the, like the final color for this single ray that comes in, but the, uh, the shader itself will subsample the space to find out the uh, final value of the color. Because they don't communicate, it will always use the color of the node group while sampling, whereas if you would combine the two, it would actually calculate the correct color per sample. So this is not something I can fix without uh, hacking, or actually hacking into the Blender code. Um, yeah, with that, I come to an end. Here are some acknowledgments for photos, uh, for the preview scene, etc. Here's the QR code, if to the, uh, goes to the link above if you would like to uh, sample the materials that I put there. Thank you. Yeah, um, it's, it's different math. Yeah, so you're then looking at diffractive optics. Um, so butterfly, is, it is both geometrical, like color, color through structure. Uh, but thin films are easy to describe with relatively simple math. Um, if you go into the realm of photonic crystals and, and like color through structure, you can make it very hard very quickly. Um, so no double slit experiments? Yeah, no, 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 no. Uh, the, the, I know that on Blender Artists there are some people that have at least implemented uh, mimicking the diffractive uh, uh, optical elements. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just different math. Anybody else? Anything? Absolutely, absolutely. Because when you showed the first two soap bubbles, I thought the right one is much too dry for real soap bubbles. Ah, isn't isn't ah, this ah. because of this uh, thickness? Uh, in, in that case, the, 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 let's, let's just go to that image. In that case, the uh, thickness well, is relatively soft. thin. It's not constant. Um, I faked it here. Uh, by driving the thickness with uh, two noise structures, one rough noise structure, and then a, I think it was a m magic structure where the uh, input vector was driven by another noise. Uh, yeah, so get the swirly effect, because that's what, exactly what I saw in the photo that I used as a reference. Um, so um, with these thicknesses, like it's accurate, but exactly what you said, like as soon as you go to really thick 
uh, layers, just plug in a, a, a Fresnel note or something like a glass shader and make the smooth transition where you like it to be to go from the uh, interference shader to the standard macroscopic shader. Yeah. Um, th this this was RGB both, uh, sorry, S RGB yeah, both. Because, yeah. Uh, 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 with the new AGX, uh, is that the, the, the Filmic and the uh, RGB, you might get more white. Like in photo, you see more white in the yellow part of the reflection. Well, the yours is like very sharp yellow. Um, well, the photo is also sRGB, right? So th that's yeah. not the reason. Um, but but I am interested in how this translates to other color spaces, for sure. Yeah. yeah that's why it's color space, maybe the wrong word, because it's not about the color space of the camera, but like how the camera takes the picture, but like how light works. Yeah, yeah. So essentially the approximation in, in this node group is that you say my red, green, and blue colors are lasers. That That's essentially the assumption so between the math. Question, like, uh, how different would it be if you actually, if every light ray was instead defined by a, uh, a frequency instead of like three values? Because, yeah, so let me say yellow, yellow is the frequency for yellow instead of two, uh, half, half so, red. So, so you mean uh, like in the, the spectral implementation? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I did that, if you go to the, the, the thread, I did that to compare uh, for the sRGB color space where I put a spectral implementation of uh, like over the full sun uh, spectrum and it's, it is different but uh, it's also much, much slower so I would say it's not worth the effort. Um, but it, it is possible. The problem here is that you're still you're, you're assuming a spectrum that, and I did, I did it for the white light spectrum. But if you have a yellow light in your scene, in your scene, what yellow is it? Is it is it like a, a, some hot metal, or is it a fluorescent tube? And that that kind of information we simply don't have in cycles. So. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I think he ended his talk with on this scale, we don't have a color. Yeah. So I ask, is there a minimum? Um, so these are coming together, right? They're probably 700 nanometers. Yeah, and smaller. I mean, th this is within the limitation that I already told you, is accurate down to zero nanometer. So if you make this, uh, if you look at the uh, bubble, it actually starts as be not being there, because if there's no bubble layer, it's not there. So it's really physically accurate in that sense. Um, it is tight, like, why it works down to zero is because the uh, model assumes it's all an infinitely flat plane, whereas the virus has 3D structure that you cannot resolve anymore with light. They, they are, but the, like what saves us here is that the film is only thin in one direction and does not contain any information other than the thickness. Yeah. All right, thank you very much.